and George here. In this first video, we're going to learn how to create our own procedural textures inside of Unity. We're going to make a texture at runtime by iterating over every single pixel in a texture we create and evaluating a function to figure out what color it should actually be. In our case, that function is going to allow us to generate our own checkerboard of black and white or really any colors that you want. So I already have Unity open and I created a new project called Texture Fun. What we'd first need to do is let's bring in a game object into the scene. So game object, 3D object, and I'm going to bring in a cube. Frame in on that, it's transforms, let's reset them as well. Hit F again, there we are. Now we're going to need a material for this object because we don't want it using the default one. So go ahead and click on assets, right click, create, and make a material. Let's call this material checkerboard. Go ahead and apply that material by dragging it onto your cube. And now it's time for us to actually work on some code. So going to assets, right click, create, and C sharp script. Let's call this checkerboard as well. Double click to open it up in your IDE. All right, so we need to do a couple things to start off. Since we're dealing with textures, we're gonna naturally need to be messing around with the mesh renderer of the object, which holds the material, which is where we get to place our textures into so they show up on our objects. So let's go ahead and grab a reference to both the mesh renderer and the texture, just for safekeeping. So we'll do a mesh renderer, mesh renderer, and we'll also do a material, material. And we're also going to need a texture object. We're working with texture 2Ds in this case. Uh, we'll be working with texture 3Ds in a future video in this series. So for right now, let's just do a texture 2D, and that's going to get populated at runtime by the texture we're creating. Now inside of start, we need to go ahead and grab references to our mesh renderer and our material. So let's go ahead and do that by doing mesh renderer is going to be equal to get component mesh renderer. And we'll just do material is going to be equal to our mesh renderer dot material. And we need to use the lowercase version, not the class. We're going to require that there's a mesh renderer. So we might as well go ahead and do a required component up here and type of mesh renderer. That way, when we apply this script to our cube object, or that is if we apply it to an object that doesn't have a mesh renderer, such as a standard game object with nothing else attached to it, we're going to get some problems. Unity is going to flag it for us and we know that we need to attach the right things. Now we can go ahead and create our texture object. So let's go ahead and do texture is equal to a new texture 2D. And we've got a few parameters to fill in. We need to put in our width and our height. So I'm going to do 256 by 256 to start off with. And then we can determine what our texture format is going to be. And in my case, I'm going to go with RGBA32. That is the R, G, B, and an A each have eight bits assigned to them and their values can range between zero and 255. Although with what we're dealing with here, those values are actually gonna be between zero and one because they're normalized and they're easier to work with a lot of times than the actual integer values. Now, the next thing we need to deal with is whether or not we want mipmaps generated. I'm gonna say true. And lastly, is whether or not we want this texture to be in linear space or sRGB space. Go ahead and read up on that if you want to know the difference between the two, but basically it has to do with the gamma situation of, of textures in your monitor, and I'm going to set this to true. I do want it in linear space. Now, we're not working with the inspector in this case because our texture isn't generated until runtime. Therefore, if we want to manipulate different properties of the texture, that is how it's filtered or the wrap mode for the texture, we're going to need to do this through code. So let's do that by doing texture dot wrap mode is going to be equal to texture dot wrap mode and we're going to do clamp. I'm doing clamp because this means that the values at the edges are going to continue on to infinity even if our UVs kind of go over them or or maybe push a little further. Uh, the reason for this is because sometimes you can get color bleeding from one side to the other if you're not careful, especially when it's interpolating values. And this is just going to make sure that our edges stay crisp. Next up, I'm going to go to texture dot filter mode and I'm gonna set this equal to, let's go to filter mode dot bilinear. We're using bilinear so we have some interpolation between our pixel values or texel values on it. If you use point, you're actually gonna be using nearest neighbor, which means uh, you have no interpolation and whatever the pixel value is at that location, it's going to be set for any nearby locations as well. Now that we have both of these, we actually should go ahead and assign our texture to our material. 
So we do this by actually messing with the shader itself that's attached to it. And to do that, we need to know what the names of the different slots are for the shader. So if we come back into Unity, go on to Checkerboard, go to Checkerboard Material, and we take a look here, it says Albedo. If we click on the little gear in the upper right hand corner and hit Select Shader, it'll give you a list of all the different properties that it has. In our case, the one we want to deal with is the albedo property, which is underscore main text. That's its name, that's its string value if we want to grab this and assign something to it. So jumping back over into Visual Studio, let's go ahead and do our material dot set texture, and we'll use the name underscore main text, and then we're going to set our texture to it. Now, right now, our texture is just a blank image at this point we are going to change the pixel values in a function we're about to create and then apply that to the texture. Coming on down, let's go ahead and create two different methods that are going to help us out here. The first one I'm going to make is a void create checkerboard. And the next function we're going to create is a void evaluate checkerboard pixel. And actually that's going to take in an integer value for where we are in the image on the X axis and where we are on the image in the Y axis. And it's not actually going to return void, it's going to return a color value. What we're about to do here is inside of create checkerboard, we're going to create a double loop. We're going to iterate over all the Y values and then all the X values. Therefore, we're going to iterate over every single pixel inside of our image. For each pixel, we're going to call evaluate checkerboard pixel and get a color value for that location and assign it to our texture. The first thing though I do want to do really quick is take a second and create a serializable field. And this is going to be a float width. And I'm going to set that to 10.0F. What width is, is the width of an actual checker. So now that I have a width, I know exactly how wide one of my checkers should be. Now I can jump into my double for loop. So let's do a four, and I'm gonna do another four after that, and then we'll fill that in in just a second. We'll do another four right there, and there we are. Now the first one I like to start with usually is going from Y into X, so that I'm iterating on the outside through the Y's, but then through each inner loop, I'm actually iterating through each column or each X value. So I'm gonna do int Y is gonna be equal to zero, and I'm gonna do Y is less than texture dot height. We don't want it to exceed that, and then we're going to do Y plus plus. Now we're going to go here and do int X is equal to zero. X is less than texture dot width, X plus plus. Now what we can do is actually evaluate our checkerboard pixel. So let's copy this function name and paste it right here. And we're going to pass in our X and our Y values. And now we need the code that's actually going to figure out what that value should be. Now to make this work, we're going to need a little bit of math and some conditional statements. First of all, we want to subdivide our entire image into regions. That is region one, region two, region one, region two. That is checkerboard white, checkerboard black, checker white, checker black, so forth and so on. One of the easiest ways to do this is to use the modulus operator, which will take a large number like our 256 right here. And depending on the number we use, say modulus our width, it's going to change every time we iterate over this 256 to zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and so on and so forth. So it's going to keep repeating that pattern over and over again. And we can use that to create our checkerboard. It, it basically puts it into chunks for us. So I'm going to go ahead and do a float value X is going to be equal to our width divided by X modulus, whoops, modulus our width. But the way I'm thinking about doing this is I don't want to keep track of whether I'm in a white region or a black region. I just want to take each one of these regions that I'm in and split them into two. That is both a white and a black region together. So let's actually multiply this by two. So I actually have twice the width. That is both regions in the same area. Okay, now that I've done that, let's actually make this float just to make sure. Just to make sure my order of operations is correct, I'm going to put another series of parentheses around that. And I personally love normalizing numbers. It's not always necessary and you don't have to do it in this case, but I like it because it brings things back down to a range that I understand. I pretty much know exactly what happens between zero and one. And there's a lot of functions out there that work very well with normalized values. So what I will do is to normalize this, I'm going to divide by the width times 2.0F. 
And now I've normalized all of my values. Moving on now, what I'm gonna to wanna to do here is determine whether or not I am in the proper range. That is, I have a value between zero and one. Well, if any value is between zero and 0 0.5, then make that black or white. And then for the other part of the range, we'll make that the opposite. So we're gonna go ahead and create an int value. And I'm gonna say VX is equal to one by default. However, if my value X happens to be less than zero, then I'm gonna say that VX is equal to zero. Excuse me, not zero, 0 0.5. There we are, that's what I wanted. Now we're gonna to need to do the same step for the Y axis as well. So we're gonna copy that and paste it and I'm gonna change everything with an X to a Y. So let's just go ahead and do that really quick. All right, so now I have an X and a Y value. How do I use these to determine what color a part of a checkerboard should be? Because technically if I use these as they are, I'm just gonna end up with vertical stripes of black and white regions. I need to alternate this pattern back and forth. And it turns out for checkerboards, there's a really easy conditional statement you can use to determine where you are in the checker, the checkerboard and what color it should be. And that is to check whether or not VX and VY are the same value. If they're the same value, and that value doesn't matter if it's black or white, then it's one color. That is, we'll say it's white. However, if it's they're different, if VX is one and VY is zero, then it's the opposite color. Let's say black in this case. Let's go ahead and create that conditional. We're gonna do a float value is equal to zero. And I'm gonna say if VX is equal to VY, then my value is gonna be equal to one. And if they're not equal, then it's gonna stay as a value of zero. Now I need to create my color that I'm going to return. So let's do a return new color. And that's going to be value, value, and value because I'm just filling the R, G, and B channels with that value. And I'm gonna set the alpha to be 1.0 so that it's completely opaque. I'm not dealing with transparencies here. Now that that's done, we can come on back up here and finish things off. Although it looks like I'm missing a parenthesis. Yep, so let's go ahead and do that to get rid of this error. There we are, perfect. All right, so we have evaluated the checkerboard pixel, but now we need to store that value in our image. So I'm gonna do color temp is equal to that. And now I'm going to go to the image and use the set and use the set pixel method. Now there's also the set pixels method, which allows you to iterate and create an array of all the colors and pass it all in one go. I'm not going to use that in today's lesson. We're going to use that in the later lesson. So let's just go ahead and use set pixel. So I'll do texture dot set pixel. And I need to pass in the X and Y value, which we already have. And then now the color, which we just calculated. Now by itself, that is not going to have anything show up on the screen. We actually need to instruct Unity that, hey, the texture has been updated. It's time for you to apply this to the object. It's time for you to upload that thing to the GPU. So we're going to go ahead and do texture.apply. And that's that. So all we need now to do is actually call this method. So inside of start, when we're completely done, we might as well go ahead and call create checkerboard. Save that. It'll go through, grab all of our components, set up our texture, cr call create checkerboard, iterate through all the different elements, apply it, and uh, that's pretty much it. So why don't we come back over here, go to our cube now, and apply our C Sharp script to it. So click and drag it over here. There we are. And let's go ahead and hit play. And there you are. We have a nice checkerboard on the surface. Now you notice it's a little bit blurry. Now this is because we're dealing with 256 pixel values. If you want it to be cleaner, because it is a checkerboard we're dealing with and we want those harsh, crisp lines, it might be better off for us to go up here and change filter mode to point instead. If we do that, you'll notice the incredibly hard lines between each of these. And you know, for a texture such as this, that might be exactly what you want. Now this will work on anything. We can come over here go to game object, we can create a sphere, for instance, and go ahead and apply our checkerboard to that and hit run. And you can see right there that uh, both of them are working just fine. So congratulations, you've made your first procedural texture in Unity. Uh, I know a checkerboard's not that terribly interesting, but it is going to lead us down the road to some more interesting effects. In the following lesson, we're going to begin moving towards generating 3D textures. That is, we're actually going to create a three-dimensional checker texture. That's kind of cool, which means that we can actually move the object through space and it's going to sample different parts of the texture. It's gonna change how it looks. Before we do that, we actually need to learn how to first generate UVs that exist in three dimensions, as opposed to the typical two-dimensional ones we're all used to. So that's what we're gonna do in the next video. 
Anyway, I'll see you all next time. Hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. Uh, so long and goodbye. <laughs>